This time on Graveyard Cars, the team struggles to work with aftermarket parts. Alyssa gets her hands dirty. And the ghouls team up to tear down two cars that are worth more than their lives. Coming up on this episode of Graveyard Cars. In case you missed it, we got the rear valance and a bunch of pieces put on our 1973 Ford Cuda. I had the opportunity to work with Alyssa on all of the assembly line markings, where they go, the correct colors and shades. She did a great job. We got the drivetrain installed in our 1970 Hemi Charger RT four-speed car, one of 56. And to top it off, I had the opportunity to drive the 1958 Plymouth Fury Christine. When installing the, the dash on the Hemi Charger, uh, everything went really well. It, it bolted right in and everything. The only issues we had was a few hiccups with the, the bulkhead. It's uh, kind of difficult to get into the firewall from underneath of the dash because it's so high up that you got to reach up uh, really high to get the clips to snap all the way through. But other than that, everything seemed to hook up just fine. Uh, Instrument Specialties did a great job on the dashboard and uh, it looks like it's it's going to work out really well. Each day that I'm working with the new team here, uh, I'm gaining more and more confidence. Seeing the dash, very expensive, very rare, correct original dash with the correct original VIN going into our 70 Hemi Charger, I'm at ease knowing that the new team has that under control. That sucked that thing down nice, a lot nicer than it was before, yeah. Mark. Oh my my, oh Isn't hell nice? yes, got to put on my potty dress. Yes. <laughs> I don't really have a party dress that I wear on a regular basis. Right now, Will's getting ready to walk in the booth and shoot our FC7 Plum Crazy Challenger, DBC 2210. Covers in three and a half. Three and a half coats. Go get them, Tiger. Go get them. Remember, <laughs> you're not going to be doing that, are you? Yeah, I'm just going to watch. OK. OK. did a phenomenal job. Absolutely as close to perfect as you can get. And it is a relief for me to know that because I don't have the time. I'm the first to tell you, I'm no spring chicken. Painting a car is not easy, and you know that. Your shoulder got yes. sore. Sweating, 20 pounds overweight, it's a ton of work. Very good job, very nice, very nice work. You can go ahead and clean your, clean your paint gun, and we are done, cut. Right. Here's the thing. It, it is a nice job. He did a phenomenal job. I mean, I've never had a painter other than myself lay it out that nicely before. He was kind of like saying, oh, I did the best job ever, you know, and... Uh, Are we still rolling, um, Mark? I thought you said cut. No, I was, No, we're cut. I don't know why oh, they're... What are you doing? What, what's you going on? You guys don't even follow instructions? Right now, Mike's just finished plumbing out the 400 Magnum for our 72 Dodge Charger. So a while back, I had a customer up out of Canada that had gotten the body and the paintwork done in a 72 Charger, um, but kind of ran out of steam at that point, wasn't able to put the rest of it together, sent the car down here to us. Well, once it got here, I realized it was a little bit bigger project. Number one, it, it was really um, the wrong color by about four shades. Basically, we had to redo the body and paint on the outside of the car. And the other thing I had to do was put together the 400 Magnum that you see here on the stand. He, again, I just, I get sucked into this aftermarket crap and I hate doing it, but he is the customer and that's what he wanted. That's why you see the Edelbrock RPM heads on it. It's got an Edelbrock torquer intake manifold. It's got a 750 Edelbrock on the top of it. We are no longer ever again putting an engine in a car without running it on the engine run stand. It's been us too many times. So, boo, chakalaka. Oops, timing's out 180 is my guess, but let me try advancing it to see if it compensates for it. Go. Go ahead, hit it. You want to double check your firing order one more time? One, four, three, six, five, seven, two. Right? I think it's coming out of the coil, but that doesn't make any sense. There's, some, there's oil coming out of the coil. There's oil coming out of it? Yep. Oh, boy. Here's the deal, and this is why I'm putting the brakes on any more aftermarket stuff. There's so many multitude of things that it can be causing it not to run right now. It's got a used coil, which is fine, because it's, it's not the way it's going to be dressed out when it's done, okay? This is just to run it on the run stand. Well, the used coil is puking oil, which can affect the way it energizes the points. So I'm going to have him put another coil on it, see if the test coil cures it. 
If this was an OEM motor, I'd go right to one, two, three, four, five, I'm done. Now I've got to start back over at Wells with the aftermarket push rods that are too short or too long, and they're hanging open a valve. Is that what's popping? Is it the coil that's popping on it? We got no oil pressure. That's not good. Yard that engine off there, disassemble it completely, turn it upside down, drain all the oil out of it, take the pan off it. When there's nothing wrong in there and everything looks fine, let's take the heads off it, buy a new set of head gaskets oh, for so it. Would. Then we'll knock the pistons out of it, and then we'll go through the short block and find the oil galley that the, the, <laughs> the machine shop left out. Because that's the only thing it can be, or it could be a bad oil pump. It could be all the valves are out of adjustment. Which is why I never want to do I'm never did doing that. Did anybody check it before? I did. I set the whole thing up. I set the latch to zero, like the book said to do. They're hydraulic lifters, but they're adjustable. Just stupid I've ever heard in my life. There's some wizard of aftermarket parts, and that's what he does. He sits back with his little tall hat on and his little rod, and he looks down and he says, Ah, there you are, Mark. I didn't I didn't realize you were having a good day. Wow. You know what I'm saying? We have a ton of work to get done this week. The vinyl top has to be installed on our 1970 Hemi Charger. We need to find out what is wrong with the 400 Magnum's oiling system and fix it. Alyssa needs to find out what it's like to work in the trenches and get her hands dirty here at Graveyard Cars. We've got a 440 that needs to be started on the engine run stand. We have two very rare and valuable cars that need to be disassembled. And the final paint on our 1970 Challenger 446 pack is waiting in the wings. This incredible story becomes more ghastly with each report. They're coming to get you, Barbara. So I'm just right now about to sit down and make some calls to get caught up on the history on some of the cars. What's going on? Hi, is this Garth? Yes. This is Alyssa from Graveyard Cars. Oh, Alyssa. I thought it was your dad. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing pretty good. How are you? I actually had met him last summer when he came to the shop, so it was really easy to talk to him on the phone. Yeah, what I'm doing is kind of calling and touching bases um, and kind of just catching up on what I've been left out on. Yeah, my dad just seems to kind of shove papers and files, and he doesn't really have any headings or any, yeah, my dad's a mess. I bought that thing, I'm gonna say 15 years ago, Alyssa, and I had in that documentation the original owner's paperwork, who he only had it for a little bit, he sold it to the guy that I bought it from. Garth has a collection of cars, none that need work like the extent of this one. That's why he got in contact with my dad. He just couldn't do it himself. He needed some help, some expertise. You know, I, I didn't want to bring it to anybody because I wanted it to be done right. You know, when I saw the show and everything else, and they called me to that, we started talking. I said, that's the way I want the car done, and that's what I decided to send it to your dad. It's going to be a lot easier since I'm easier, I'm able to put like a face and a name and a voice to the paperwork rather than just looking at it in like sheets of paperwork because I really don't, I mean, looking at the car, they're just cars to me. They don't, that doesn't make much sense. So. <laughs> hey, listen, good luck and enjoy working with your dad and taking care of everything, man. Good talking to you. <laughs> thank you. I'm sure we'll talk again soon. Thanks, Bob. Bye. All right, thanks. Bye-bye. Now that we have the complete drivetrain installed in our 1970 Hemi Charger, there's still a lot of little things that aren't on our progress board that need to be done. So I'm gonna round up the team and go over the list of stuff that has to be done now. Okay guys, we got a lot going on. Uh, this is gonna be a really, really busy week. The 400, as you know, failed. So we're gonna disassemble that, find out what's wrong with it. Uh, hopefully it's nothing major. Uh, Alyssa, I would like you to start making some phone calls. I want you to follow up on the Hemi Charger owner and the 446 pack Challenger owner, okay? The rest of the guys and us, we're gonna go over, start disassembling the 71 Dodge Challenger RT383 factory opera window, a uh, former roof car. If that goes well, I'm hoping in a perfect world, we might be able to get the uh, 70 Coronet RT convertible, 426 Hemi, four speed, one of two ever made, disassembled. And really, honestly, to, to top off a great week would be to be able to start the engine for the 446 pack car and get the 400 Magnum back over on the engine run stand and get it running. So it's only what, 10 things? All right, let's do it. Right now we're getting ready to disassemble the 1971 Dodge Challenger RT. This is a very unique car in as much as it came with the factory formal roof package, which was actually only available on the SE cars in 1970. You couldn't get a 1971 Dodge Challenger with an SE package, but you could get it with the same formal roof and overhead consulate and some of the basic trim. Very unique car, gonna document it as we disassemble it. The other thing we're doing today is this is my new step towards team building. I've got the entire team. I got the painter, the body man, the assembly guy, 
guys, everybody involved at Graveyard Cars is gonna work as a team to get the car disassembled. This is an opportunity for us to work together as a team. I want this car disassembled in the exact same format that it gets reassembled, and you know all about that. So what's the last things that you're putting on the car when it gets over to your stall? The interior. You're getting doing the interior, doing the exterior trim, ornamentation, so that's the first stuff that's gonna come off. Um, this is very much like being down at Gitmo, all right? I know you're not familiar with that because now you guys are from the service. We follow orders or people die. It's that simple. Colonel Jessup, as you were. I'm working on the Hemi GTX right now, getting it ready for sealer and paint. I got the whole car all seam sealed. Uh, back to the way factory did it, so you have to kind of duplicate that, which is because where the metals come together, you know, they're all welded through there at the bottom, but there's still little pockets that, in between each weld. So when you lay the seam sealer down over the top of it, it just ensures that nothing's coming in or out. Got the whole thing sealed, then I noticed that the person that had worked on this prior to me never really went through and fixed all the little rust pits and whatnot, and that was my fault because I should have caught it and I didn't. So after it was sealed, I had to stop, grab the boss to come take a look, see what he wanted to do. And that's why you'll see the primer in there now, is because I had to go through and put like three or four coats of good thick primer on it to fill in all the little rust pits that were left. So in this back portion, it's most important because from here over, you see everything. Up here, you know, the carpet's over, you don't see anything, but this being a convertible, this is all all visual, so this part here particularly needs to look just as good as the outside of the car does. So going back through and fixing little stuff like that, you, you just have to. So now that the car's sealed and primered, we're gonna let it cure in the booth for a little while, and I'm gonna jump over and help Mark on the green Challenger. As we all know, the second digit in a Chrysler VIN number establishes the class of the car. L for low, M for medium, H for high, for example. What would an O in the second digit represent? Would it be taxi class, police class, or super stock? The answer coming up after the break. This incredible story becomes more ghastly with each report. So what does an O represent when it's located in the second position of a VIN on a Chrysler? The answer is super stock. O was given out as a special class for the super stock cars, such as the Dart and the Barracuda that came with race Hemis from the factory. This incredible story becomes more ghastly with each report. Right now we're getting ready to disassemble the 1971 Dodge Challenger RT. Well, we got some extra pieces in here, kids. Hmm. We got a couple carburetors. We got uh, an extra air cleaner, timing chain cover. Check out that beautiful HP left-hand exhaust manifold, yeah, huh? Great. Now remember, 71 valve coverage uses the three nipple breather on it, and then they went back to the single nipple breather in 72, three, and four, and 70 is also a single. Okay. And the other thing you'll notice is this valve cover is almost identical except for this. This is 71 on up. On that bulge, huh? That bulge, yep. Okay. We got an original polyglass spare in there. Oh, look at too. there. Oh, isn't look that at nice? that, isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Now that's cool, that's the original spare tire. They were yep. factory Goodyear polyglass. Is that a 15 or a 14? Uh, this 71 should be a 15. Well, it depends. It could have got it either way. Oh, Remember, the cars were available with 14 and 15. There was no standard minimum tire on it. It's a 14, G70. Ah, so the car came with 14s. Interesting footnote here on the Mopars, uh, the Cuda and the Challenger, the E-bodies. If it came from the factory, if that E-body came from the factory with a 15-inch wheel, you would have gotten mandatory a collapsible spare because there wasn't enough room in that small trunk of an E-body for a 15-inch full-size spare. So you would have got the collapsible, more compact spare. However, if you had 14-inch wheels, you would have gotten a standard 14-inch full-size spare, but you could have optionally ordered the collapsible spare. Do this car get repainted at any time or is this it... car is an original fj6 car which is sassy grass green what's interesting the owner told me he took it in for a repaint in the mid 70s right takes it into your average half wit body shop average half wit body shop pulls up a code says yep that's it paint it they pulled up sublime this is oh. fj5 when you're talking about the Mopar colors, uh, it can be a little bit confusing. For example, FJ5. In a Plymouth lineup, that's limelight green. That's the Dodge version would be sublime, 
green. You go to the next darker shade, which is the FJ6, and you have Sassy Grass or Go Green. This car is a factory FJ6 Go Green car. The color was supposed to be darker than what the body shop put on it. The body shop just didn't know. They went, what does it matter? Let's paint it that color. Well, in reality, it's several shades lighter than the FJ6. Hi, is this Guy? I'm just doing a follow-up call on Guy Melita on his car. I understand that your dad was the one that bought it originally? Yeah, and, uh, my dad bought it when I was nine years old, 1972, he bought the car. So Guy actually found his car at a gas station. Um, him and his dad and his sister were on their way to school, and they decided to stop and take a look at it, where his dad actually ended up purchasing it. His dad was a cop for 20 years for New York City Police Department. He had promised his dad that they were going to restore it together. Well, then you know how it is. Life kind of happens. You grow up, you get married. And then they had the big gas crisis. So they ended up parking it because gas was too expensive. And so then time just kind of passed. Guy's dad got really sick. So we never really were going to do it together. So I promised him I'd get it done. So Guy actually initially took it to another shop where they just overcharged him, had it way too long. And so he kind of lost hope on it ever being restored. Thank God I found great little cars and uh, get it done for him. That went well. I'm just going to see how many more people I can get in contact with and how much more information I can get done today. I uh, just finished priming and sealing the Hemi GTX. Now I'm going to jump over and help Mark disassemble the green Challenger. What's happening there? Is there something for me going away? Somebody passing on? Oh, uh, you want to help us pull this car oh, apart? Heck, that's, what we're looking, that's what we're looking right. for. That's what we're looking for. We got all the car disassembled. We got the interior out of it, the dash, the air conditioning system. We have all of the engine and transmission from the top side disconnected. Uh, we have the doors off disassembled. Uh, literally, all that's left are the things that we have access to from the bottom. So we're getting ready to raise it up in the air and get started on disassembling the bottom of the car. OK, first thing we're going to have to do is pop the wheels off at mid-height so we can disconnect the upper control arms. For me, my favorite aspect of the 71 Challenger RT is, and it's got to be the fact that it's a formal roof car. It's an A78 package car. See, in 1970, if you had an SE, it would have been an A47. The whole car would have been dressed up with SE, the special edition. Apparently, it wasn't very popular because in 71, you couldn't get the special edition, but you could still get the cool, small back window. It used the formal headliner, and it had an overhead consulette. Everything that a SE would have had, except the trim panels and the rest of the SE call-out packages. So is this a rare car, Mark? It built like 138 with the SC formal package. Then you get sassy grass green. Quarter scoops, I think, are optional, but they may have been standard on 71s. It's, it's down there. It's 50, 60, maybe, somewhere in that range. Right now, Royal's taking the last piece off the car, which is the SE rear window plug. This is really cool. Uh, this is what makes it when you hear about an, uh, even though this is a formal roof car, not an official SE, it's the same window plug that was used. When we take this fiberglass plug that holds, that holds this glass out of the car, this opening will be a regular Challenger opening. They didn't modify the original Challenger opening. They made a plug to go into it. So kind of like the Superbird in the Daytona. You take that your way? I think you will. Look at that. So see, now all of a sudden, you have a regular Challenger back window. This car's real rarity, they made a lot of 71 Challengers. I don't know what the exact count is on how many they made with uh, the formal back window, but my guess is it's less than 100. When you got a car that's down in the lower demographics, like this one, probably in the two or 300, or maybe less, I haven't checked the number on how many came with a formal roof, but I know it's very low. You've got to put that back in. I mean, that's the coolest part of the whole car right there. And this is all pretty solid stuff. A lot of this, these channels are usually rotted out. This one's nice. Earlier, we started our 400 Magnum out of our 72 Charger. It started up and ran good, but had zero oil pressure. So we shut it down immediately. 
I had a suspicion it was an oil galley plug in the front, which is easy to miss, and I was right. However, when you take the front of the engine apart and you see that somebody missed an oil galley plug, I want to be sure the rest of the engine, which I did not put together or build, is done correctly. So I instructed Mike to disassemble the engine, mic everything, plastic gauge everything, and if it's right, put it back together again. We removed the 400 off of the engine run stand. It is now on a conventional engine stand. It's time to disassemble it and do an inspection. Hopefully, there's nothing wrong inside. That would be a huge setback if there was. But if not, and there's nothing wrong, we can bolt it back together and get it back on the engine run stand soon. You gotta be careful taking these cams out. There's a gear on them that likes to tear up. So you gotta be real careful. Our 400 Magnum is ready to be disassembled. I gave that task over to Mike. While he's working on that, I'm gonna work on the 70 Hemi Charger, getting the roof ready for the new vinyl top installation. So what I'm doing is, uh, when you tape off your roof, because this is a vinyl roof car, that clear that we use, that 2000, uh, 2002 clear, is really thick. And so it creates these hard lines. So even though we didn't need to repaint the roof other than the pre-paint, we do need to put the vinyl top on it. And Larry was saying he's seen in the past where these lines, these thick lines will swell up through the vinyl top. So I'm just feathering those back so we have a nice transition so that doesn't show up so bad. Hopefully it'll show up at all, I should say. And that's not one of those things that we have to use a block on because you're not gonna see a little bit of uh, transition underneath that vinyl top like you would if it was out in the open. So I just run a tape line right through the holes where the vinyl top moldings go, and that gives me a good line to work from. I think that the factory would have painted the whole car at the same time, don't you? Yeah. And it just would have been all one horrible paint job, <laughs> and then they would... <laughs> They had to come back and put a vinyl top on it. So this car is a factory V1X car, which means it gets a black vinyl top. Uh, it was funny because the vendor actually screwed up and sent me a white vinyl top, which is great because remember my car from high school was a white vinyl top, burnt orange car. So I, playing with the guy, I took a picture of it setting on there and sent it to him and said, I don't care what your car was coated with, I'm putting that on. I said, I'm kidding, dude, I'm kidding. Yeah, 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 I figured you was kidding, but Yeah, I could tell by your reaction that you figured I was kidding. <laughs> the fact that you were gonna kill me. Right. Yeah, put him in a suitcase. Makes and... perfect sense, right? Okay, so really I've got that about where it needs to be. We'll wanna mask out uh, 18 inches with paper and then go to plastic on the rest oh, okay. of the car. So that's ready to blow off. So with that, we're ready to go to the next step, which is just to bag the car, make sure no glue gets on the rest of it, and cut Larry loose. Now that we've got the 400 Magnum off of the engine run stand and over on a regular stand, that frees up our engine run stand. So now we can put the 446 pack out of our 70 Challenger on there and fire it up. My level of confidence is 100% on the 446 pack. It will start, run, and perform like it's supposed to. Oh, look at this, look at this. <laughs> These are brand new reproduction of the original Holley carburetors. I'll end up changing out a couple of bolts on them. This is the center one. See now, the original ones are a little bit different than these, but these work great. These are great replacement ones. The main, the biggest thing that you notice is this has a hex head on it. And the original Hollies have a large flat screw that they put on there. So you can take these out and put the original ones in. See, so here's an example of the original screw. That's the flat tip instead of the hex. So once we get this thing running and, and ready to go in the car, we'll switch these out with these. But right now, I don't want to mess with the carburetors. I want them to run the way they're supposed to run. Okay, so this is the center one. Can You know how I can tell that this is the center one? The linkage. The linkage? Yeah. Yep. That linkage right there doesn't appear on the outboards. Let's open up a couple of the other outboards, the other two outboards. I got a good feeling about this gentleman. 1970 446 pack. It's a four-speed car. What which is what on what's the alphanumeric call out for a four-speed? I don't know. D21, Delta 21. Yep. 
It's an A33 track pack car with 354 gears. What's the alphanumeric call out for that? I don't know. A33, 410s, A34. Don't run any fuel yet because I want to crank it over a little bit. Keep got oil pressure. Okay, oh. so you got fuel pump on. So let's get fuel up here to where we know it's, give us some. Yeah. She's pumping. She's pumping. Ready? Yeah. Pump it. Okay, let the battery charge it for a second. Shut the fuel off. Crank it over. Yeah, we got no spark. This incredible story becomes more ghastly with each report. The unburied dead are coming back to life. Okay, let the battery charge it for a second. Yeah, we got no spark. The fact that the 440 didn't fire right off is because of a faulty coil. Uh, we have a, a, usually it's a proven coil that we use, just like a proven carburetor that we use. In this case, we had a six pack, uh, so we used the original six pack setup to start the engine. But the coil that we used has started 100 engines on that stand. It started leaking oil out of it. When it does that, it starts losing its ability to create power, and therefore we had a faulty ignition, so to speak. That's the only reason that engine didn't fire up like that. You ready? Pan that mother humper off. It's still Way really retarded. Everything's working great. Uh, you know, you never get one of these things started up perfectly. Timing needed to be bumped a little bit. Originally, we had it 180 out, such a life. But it's running now, it's running great. We got all the oil pressure is perfect, oil, water temperature is perfect. Everything is running great on it. Let it break in the camshaft for about another 15 minutes, and we'll let it cool down. Tomorrow, we'll get it moved off of that stand over onto the regular uh, assembly stand. We've got a drivetrain done. So I just got off the phone with some of our clients and went and talked to my dad to see what else I can do. Um, and he actually has something for me to get started out in the shop. I'm pretty excited. I hope that it's something to do with paint or maybe in the engine room, but I'm not sure. So what I want you to do, and I'm glad that you're excited about it, I want you to start working on helping me sort out some of the pieces. Nick's kind of been dropping the ball, which every employee always starts out a thousand miles an hour and then they start petering oh off. Well, well, you also give every employee but like he did 50 do a good job. If you look things. around to do. Uh, Usually give people like 100 different things to do, so. Well, that's because I do 2,000. But okay. you see, he's done a good job organizing up the parts room. It's looking good. Yeah. This is where he's falling apart right here. Oh my. So here's where he left off. You don't know what all these are, but okay. this, you don't need to know what this is. This is a speedometer gear for a transmission, but you could just put it there for right now. So like this right here, I can assure you there's probably lots of things like this. These are shims. So anytime What's a come, shim? A shim is something like that this? you would use in a body. No. Those are part of a window regulator assembly. Those are all part of windows. Okay. So, so you just, yeah, kind of maybe just start setting them into small piles. Find out what you actually have an accumulation of. Sorry, I don't mean to use that big word, like a lot of. And then you could put those in the bins. Was that necessary? Shit. Was it? <laughs> well, I was there when Thank you. Thank you for always creating such a constructive I'm not learning diploma. environment I'm for not, me. I paid for your <laughs> Okay, oh get them all Where are you sorted going? up. Are you not going to help me? What? No, I'm not going to stand there and do that. That's grunt work. Oh my God. Just start putting the things in the places where they belong. Okay. Rock and roll, turn and burn. Put it and do it. Fun, it and dream thank it. you. Right now we're hitting on all cylinders. I mean, we are really punching out a lot of hardware. Things are going great. Uh, that means that our 1970 Hemi Coronet RT convertible is getting disassembled. You're talking about a car that has the wildest engine available 
probably the wildest color available. It's a convertible top, it's a four speed, it's a super track pack car, and it really is an early version story of a car that was dead in a junkyard, forgotten and left to die, that came back to life because of somebody like myself two or three decades ago. Now it's just getting freshened up. This car is without a doubt, probably the most collectible car on the planet next to the 71 Hemi Cuda convertible. Royal, do you remember yeah. the history on this car? Pardon? Do you remember this car? You know, this is one of two, right? I know, that's all I know. So the car was abandoned and found in a Canadian junkyard back in the 70s. Oh, really? Motor and transmission were gone to it. And back then, there was a few guys that knew Mopars, right? Not everybody like today because of the internet, but back then. Uh-huh. He looks at the VIN number on the Finner tag, says, oh. <laughs> Oh my. Yeah, looks at the registry, there's none registered, goes and figures out that it's one of two made, and he starts building the car back together. And so what we're looking at right now, whoever built the car back in the 70s or early 80s when it was put together, actually did a phenomenal job because you remember, there was nothing available. Oh, that yeah. poor guy had to go to everything that was available. He couldn't go on the internet and just look up and see what the marking was supposed to be here or the marking was supposed to be there. He, he, no, he could probably get a lot of NOS parts. Probably a knowledgeable guy, but he could get NOS parts, which he couldn't get today. But you're still talking about a, an incredibly rare car. The 70 Coronet convertible is one of only two RTs with a Hemi. That means we gotta be on our A game. We're reusing a lot of these parts, so everything has to be inventoried and taken good care of. True or false, the 1970 E-Body Racing Mirrors, G36 painted, G37 chrome, actually were shaped completely different from each other. The answer coming up after the break. The unburied dead, dead are coming back, coming to, life. back to life. So is it true or false that the dual sport mirrors on the 1970 E-Body Challengers were mismatched? Well, the answer is true. One of the biggest complaints Tony D'Agostino has back at Tony's Parts is he will sell people a matching set of racing mirrors. They will send them back for a return saying that the left hand doesn't match the right hand in shape. They weren't meant to. The right hand is a lower profile and a little bit more of a teardrop shape than the left hand. And that's so that it will fit on the right hand side of the car and still give you the vision out the back that's needed. Because of the because obvious threat to untold, untold numbers of citizens, citizens this, this station will station remain will on, the on the air day and night. Day and night. We're knee deep on the disassembly of the Hemi Coronet convertible. Remember, that is a seven figure car. So everything's going good now, but it needs to continue to go good. So what we're looking at right now, whoever built the car back in the 70s or early 80s when it was put together, actually did a phenomenal job because you remember there was nothing available. Oh, that yeah. poor guy had to go to everything that was available. He couldn't go on the internet and just look up and see what the marking was supposed to be here or the marking was supposed to be there. He, he, no, he could probably get a lot of NOS parts. Probably a knowledgeable guy, but he could get NOS parts, which he couldn't get today. But you're still talking about a, an incredibly rare car. You know, it's kind of cool because when I was growing up, I mean, I read about cars like this, Hemi cars, four speeds, convertibles. I never dreamed I'd be working on one. I always thought the Coronet RT was a good looking car. Like, like Plymouth, their decorated car, their celebrated car was the GTX, which is a standard 440 or 426 Hemi available with both an automatic or a four speed. But to me, the GTX just never did it. I mean, it's, the 67 looks like Royals crap box. RT, so that's ugly. The 70 GTX started looking better because it looks like a 70 Roadrunner quite a bit. Uh, got the air grabber hood, got some cool things on it. But I mean, you get into the Coronet, I mean, look at this car. Look at the crazy hood scoops. I mean, these aren't just hood scoops that are sitting there that are non-functional. These are functional. They grab the air out of this Ram Charger right here. If you look at this big old orange box here, it closes down on a very special air cleaner and it draws cool air in through those scoops into this plenum over here onto this and into the actual engine itself. I mean, that's some pretty cool stuff. Simulated quarter scoops. I mean, that stuff's off the charts. That's as, as much stuff as you could throw on the outside of a car. Bumblebee stripe. Take a look at the dash. This is one of the things that's interesting, though, about this car. This car has a TikTok tack, which is the N85. That's right here. They call that a TikTok tack because it has a clock in it on the inside, and the outer perimeter is a tachometer. This one's actually optioned with it. Most of the cars today have it because people put them in them, but they don't all have an N85 code on the fender tag to support it. Um, back when the guy built this car, if you look at this, this is just a cover because that's all that was available back when the guy put the car together. They didn't have, you couldn't call up Dashpad Pros and say, hey, I need a nice 6870 B body or, well, they're actually different. But say I got a 70 B body and I need a Dashpad for it. 
he can he can send it right out to you and it's got the right material the right uh, texture the right grain the right everything but back then all you had was this hard plastic rigid uh, cover the the little short history on this is uh, Brett Torino had it had bought the car I don't know when and I certainly don't know for how much but it's an expensive car to put in his collection because he only collects the best of the best um, and they went out to start it a couple of years ago and it dropped its oil pressure and uh, started to make a uh, knocking noise. So, and it, they thought that it was a spun bearing. So that's when they reached out to me and said, well, listen, it's got a dent in the fender. It's got some updates that need to be done to it. Let's just send it up to market graveyard cars. That's how it kind of ended up here because it, you know, if, if it hadn't had the dent, if the plastic trim was a little better on the inside, like on the A pillars or it had the nice dash pad on it and it ran like a champ, I don't know if it'd be worth investing the extra money into, but right now it is. So my dad brought me out here to finally get me going and working in the shop because I've been begging to like get out in the shop and help out. And he brought me to like a pile full of nuts and bolts. So not exactly what I was hoping for when I said work in the shop. Hey, Liz, how's it going? Hey, how you it's doing? going good. How are you? Oh, pretty good. What are you up to? I am supposed to sort through all these. Oh. Yeah. So, and I really don't have any idea where to start. So I don't know what oh. any of this stuff is. First eyewitness accounts of this grisly development came from people who were understandably frightened. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Hey, Liz, how's it going? Hey. How you it's doing? going good. How are you? Oh, pretty good. What are you up to? I am supposed to sort through all these. Oh. Yeah. So, and I really don't have any idea where to start. I don't know what uh, any of this stuff is. Yeah, I, I don't know what to tell you. It's... It's kind of a nightmare. I mean, they all these look are the all, same to me, is there? Yeah, these are all door panels. I feel like springs. we could just like put them all in the same bay. Yeah, you know, yes. <laughs> would my dad even notice? Yeah, these bolts are really important. A lot of them are because even though like the aftermarket parts, they're not exactly identical to the originals. I'm so glad Dave came up and helped me out because I probably wouldn't have been able to make any progress without his help. So like. Yep, that's a key way. This right here is a part of a bumper jack. This isn't car related, this is a trailer plug. This is like for a, a master cylinder, like a brake booster. It goes through the firewall. Okay, okay, how about this stuff? This looks shinier that, than Yeah, that chrome there is almost, it's, it's pitted so bad it probably won't clean up, but it might be an odd piece that we need to re-chrome, so we'll definitely save that. Okay. So, just yeah, I don't think it's fair for Mark to give a list of this job. I mean, it's good to learn, but just kind of throwing somebody into something that's just like a random pile of a mess like that and not stay with her and kind of help her through, you know, for a little ways to kind of get her going, it's kind of tough. But she's uh, she's pretty sharp. I'm sure she can figure it out. Okay, one more. Wait, what is this? Uh, that's actually a, a black pipe fitting for a gas <laughs> pipe or something like that. It's okay. called a, a reducer, so we'll just put that to the side. <laughs> okay. That goes in the plumbing department. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Thank have you fun. again. All right, see you later. See ya. Um, I have a little bit better of an understanding on how to organize this stuff, but it's still kind of, it all still kind of looks the same to me. I'll probably be here for the next like week. As we saw earlier, the initial engine run of the 400 Magnum was a bit of a failure as we had no oil pressure. Once we disassembled it, we found that an oil galley plug was missing out of the front underneath the cam. I authorized him to completely tear the engine down, mic everything, check everything for tolerance, and reassemble it so we can get it back on the run stand. We are at that point right now. The engine is going back together. As soon as he's done, we're moving it to the engine run stand. The thing that comes to light with the aftermarket parts is it wasn't built or engineered to go on the car, not by the manufacturer of the car, by somebody else. Two is, it's not what I do. I do original equipment stuff. I just am old school and I believe in saying that the customer's always right. And I say, yeah, we can do those valve covers, that intake manifold, that carburetor, sure, go ahead and build your own engine. And all these things fall on my shoulders. 
because even though I didn't maybe build the engine or I didn't order the headers or I didn't you know, order the intake manifold, I'm the guy that has to make it work in the car. I, if I spend 40 hours chasing down a bunch of aftermarket crap that doesn't fit or doesn't work, ultimately they're coming back to me and they're not compensating me for that. That's why I hate aftermarket parts. If I want an aftermarket parts, I'd order aftermarket parts. We got fuel, here comes coil. Hit the button, baby. Stop. All right. Back the distributor off. Show on. Oh, that runs good. That runs very good. Royal needs to adjust the rockers, but that's beautiful. So, you know, it's awesome. I mean, it, it, you can't always be 100% sure, but I was reasonably sure that's what it was. So uh, now that now that we're out of the woods, he'll finish adjusting the valves. We can get it over to the paint shop, get it painted, and ready to go back in the 72 charge. Sorry about that. That Royal. sounded better. It sounded a lot better, didn't it? Nice work, Royal. It's called school. Education. Look at that, look at you go. Hey. Nice job, wow. Yeah. You're literally just finishing. Yeah. Wow, you already vacuumed and everything. You got all the nameplates out, that's cool. Really, for the most part, uh, we won't be saving those, just so you know. Okay. But, but I told you to, you know, get stuff like that out, so. It's just good for me to have a mental inventory. This looks good. Yeah. This is the, this is the brainless stuff that your predecessor, way back, also your former significant other, had a difficult time with this kind of separation. This is what happens when the when my seed, the fruit of my loin. I thought we talked about, you know, that. The fruit Let's of my loin. Let's just go with daughter, please. I feel like my week was really good, really productive. I got a lot of their clients' files done. I made a lot of phone calls. Um, I was able to get in contact with some of our clients and actually get them to email me some of their pictures. Also, I was able to get started on the parts room, so that was really exciting. I was kind of hoping for a little bit more for my first project out in the shop or maybe getting to like work with somebody, but it was really nice that Dave came up and kind of helped me out. I didn't feel so alone up there, but I think it's a great start. I just hope that maybe my dad will give me something a little bit more interesting next time. That, yeah, like an okay, now we're gonna job, get, now I mean, we got stuff to do in the shop. See, now you know what it's oh, like. Cause you it, have an acclimation going together, right? Before that, I mean, God, don't let me lose out in the shop. Well, I'm just saying that you got, you know, little babies don't come out of the womb and just take off running like Carl Lewis. All right, they gotta get, they gotta crawl, then they gotta stand up, then they gotta walk around and oh, start whatever. playing with plugins with their fingers. Oh my God. That's how we had to do it as a kid. We didn't have those safe that plugins. Would explain what you happened stick your to finger you. in a plug in and blow your kneecaps off. Alyssa did a fantastic job cleaning up the extra parts that were out there on the bench in the parts room. Uh, kudos to her, but it's not really time for a parade. We still have so much to do. Our 340 CUDA is ready for its final polish so it can get delivered to the customer. You know, as I do the final waxing on this car, I think to myself, what a great week it's been. We got the complete dash assembly, steering column, and vinyl top installed in our 1970 Dodge Charger RT. Diagnosed, disassembled, repaired, and reassembled our 400 Magnum. Alyssa did a great job reaching out to our customers and documenting, as well as cleaning and organizing the miscellaneous loose hardware that was still remaining in our parts room. The 446 pack got put on the engine run stand and fired up, ran beautiful. And we got two of the rarest cars on the planet completely disassembled and inventory. For me, the proudest moment is Will's phenomenal paint job on the FC7 1970 Challenger RT. Next time on Graveyard Cars, the film crew follows Mark for the day. The sunroof Challenger returns and it's not pretty. And work begins on the Plum Crazy 446 Pack Challenger. Coming up on the next episode of Graveyard Cars.